would like to call the November 17th, 18th, 2022 meeting of the Energy Facility Siting Council back to order. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Marcy Grail. Present. Ken Howe. Present. Hanley Jenkins. Here. Cindy Condon. Here. Perry Choctu. Here. Ann Byer. Here. You have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Are there any agenda modifications? Madam Chair, the as the uh, the record was held open for the West End Solar draft proposed order, uh, we will no longer have um, the final agenda item. I'm in front of me what the the letter was, but the uh, council's review of the West End uh, Solar draft proposed order. So that will be put off to a new uh, council meeting date. So that's the one agenda modification. Thank you. I have the following announcements. Please silence your cell phones. Those participating via phone or webinar, please mute your phone. And if you receive a phone call, please hang up from this call and dial back in after finishing your other call. For those signed on to the webinar, please do not broadcast your webcam. Reminder to council and to anyone addressing the council to please remember to state your full name clearly and do not use the speakerphone feature as it will create feedback. For agenda item E, public comment period, there are three ways to let us know you are interested in providing comments to the council. For those in person, please fill out a reg comment registration card available on the table near the entrance and submit to Nancy Hatch. For those using the WebEx, you will need to use the raise your hand feature. For those on the phone only, you will need to press star three, which will alert us that you want to speak. We will go over these options again during the agenda item. You may sign up for email notices by clicking the link on the agenda or the council webpage. You are also welcome to access the online mapping tool and any documents by visiting our website. Energy facility council, siting council meetings shall be conducted in a respectful and courteous manner where everyone is allowed to state their positions at the appropriate times consistent with council rules and procedures. Willful, accusatory, offensive, insulting, threatening, insolent, or slanderous comments which disrupt the council meeting are not acceptable. Pursuant to Oregon Administrative Rule 345-011-0080, any person who engages in an unacceptable conduct which disrupts the meeting may be expelled. Um, our first item today, make sure I got myself straight away, is the biennial fee update. This is an action item in Cicely Fleming citing fiscal analysts. The council <laughs> will uh, be presenting, and this is to consider the fee schedule for 2023-24. Cicely? Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Perfect. So good morning, Chair Grail, Vice Chair Howe, members of the Council. For the record, my name is Cicely Fleming, and I'm here to present the biennial update to the Council's schedule of fees. ORS 469441 requires the Council to adopt a schedule of fees designed to cover the Council's actual costs associated with reviewing a notice of intent, request for exemption, request for pipeline, or request for expedited re review by January 1st of each odd-numbered year. The fees are to be based on actual costs associated with each review type and reflects, reflect the size and complexity of the review. The fee schedule that Council adopts today will be effective January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2024. Next set, slide please. In addition, uh, ORS 4694212 provides that any costs associated with review exceeding the fee are still the applicant's responsibility and the department will invoice for actual costs accordingly. And then of course, if the costs are less than the fee, the department will issue a refund or reallocate as requested. So next slide. In your meeting materials, you will find the current fee schedule that was effective January of 2021 and the proposed fee schedule to be effective in 23 in its entirety. Since we're not proposing any changes to the fee structure for the application for site certificate, request for amendment, or annual fees, I have left those off this slide. Um, but this slide just shows the fees that we are uh, proposing for increase. Um, as stated earlier, the fees are to be based on the actual costs, actual historical costs to the extent they're available. Um, 
all of the notices of intent that the council has reviewed since this fee was established in 2021 fell under the wind, solar, and geothermal category. So those were the only ones we had data for. Because data was not available for the other generation types, the proposed fee um, before you today reflects the, um, the inflation adjustments for, from first quarter 2021 to fourth quarter 2022, and they have been rounded to the nearest thousandth. Um, this inflation calculation is consistent with the methodology used in site certificates uh, conditions for calculating annual inflation adjustments for the financial assurance instruments required for retirement. For wind, solar, and geothermal, the same inflation methodology was applied to the average of the actual costs incurred in this category. And as you can see um, for that one, the 42000 actually was not impacted. It ended up not increasing the fee at all once we use the average actual and then inflated it. Under expedited review and request for exemption categories, we're proposing a decrease for, for the expedited review fee and an increase to the request for exemption fee. And again, these are both, both based on the average of the actual costs um, and then uh, with the inflationary adjustment applied. So those are really the only changes here um, so pretty quick and easy, your options are to approve the fee schedule as presented or, um, propose any changes and we can get those folded in and then that would be your new fee schedule. So that is all I have for you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Chair Grove, I mean, yeah. So I just wanted to point out um, kind of one example of that. Um, so the so the wind, solar, and, and Cicely said this, but I wanted to make sure that it kind of you all absorb that because the kind of the whole point of looking at the fees is we have data that should go up or should go down based upon that information, but we should also be adjusting for inflation. You know, as Cicely talked about, well, it's sort of interesting on the wind, solar notice of intent. It's forty two and forty two, so it was forty two thousand but the average costs were less than that. So, you know, so I don't remember exactly what the dollar amount was, but when she adjusted it for inflation, it had put it back up to exactly the same amount. So it, we did go through the calculations. We did, it wasn't just stayed the same. It, it resulted in being the same, but it didn't stay the same <laughs> based on the, you know, an analysis and methodology for that. So I just wanted to make sure that that was kind of clear. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Cindy Conant, quick question. So, um, based on that, so were we refunding? Have we been refunding for the past two years? Uh, Susan yeah. probably has a better answer to that. So, it's really the, the applicant's option to be refunded. So, if we have excess money at the notice of intent, they can be refunded or they can request that it be rolled over into the application. But oh. I know Cicely, that, that's sort of a generic answer. Cicely can uh, answer that more specifically about what, you know, what the typical um, sort of applicant has requested. So if Cicely, feel free to respond. Yeah, so on um, we, when there is money left over at the NOI, they typically have us roll it forward to the application um, review phase. So it would just offset their initial payment there. Um, but I'm, I've got the data pulled up and there is only actually three instances where they came in well below that forty-two thousand um, dollar fee assessment. So the average between all of them was about uh, thirty-eight thousand. Um, so it was it came in about you know four thousand dollars less than the fee, but the there was only actually three instances where people were you know lower than that. So it's not. Okay. Sorry, the reason I ask is that the inflation number is pretty high, as we know. And so I was just curious if there were instances that we were lending them 10% or whatever it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hearing none, then we need to take action. And if someone would like to make a motion, please. Madam Chair, this is Kemp. I move the council approve the 2023-2024 schedule of fees as presented by staff. Thank you. We have a motion. May we get a second? Hanley, I'll second. Thank you, Hanley. Any other discussion? Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Hanley Jenkins. Yes. 
Ken Howe? Yes. Cindy Condon? Yes. Ann Byer? Yes. Perry Chocktooth? Yes. Marcy Grail? Yes. Motion carries, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Cicely. Thank you very much. The next item is agenda D, item D, and this is the appointment of rules coordinator. This is an action item. We have Sarah Esterson, senior policy advisor, prepared to present. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says. I don't know. <laughs> Sarah Esterson. Not prepared. I can. I can do one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a little change here. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> Um, so, for the record, Todd Cornett, um, as is on the screen, um, there's a statutory, uh, you know, uh, requirement that um, boards and commissions and agencies uh, appoint officially uh, a rules coordinator. Uh, and, you know, the reason being is not just to have sort of a point person um, for the, the department or the board or commission, but it's to work with the secretary of state's office so that they have the actual contact people that they work with and that people only certain people can file notices and you know, propose rules with the Secretary of State. They have to be registered, they have to be trained on that. Um, and so that's why we go through this process. Um, Chris Clark is currently the uh, official rules co coordinator, even though he's no longer technically in that position, he's taking a different position um, until he's replaced as the rules coordinator, he still functions in that purpose. So our recommendation, um, because Chris has taken a new position. We've hired uh, Tom Jackman to replace Chris in that position. Um, Tom is transitioning, you know, all of those duties and responsibilities to Tom, including this one. We want Tom to be replaced as the primary rulemaking coordinator, but still to retain Chris as a backup rulemaking coordinator, uh, as well as Sarah Esterson as a backup rulemaking coordinator. So. Um, obviously, with Chris's background and understanding, it'll be nice to have him just in case. Um, and then part of Sarah's responsibilities in her job uh, description is to uh, help with the rulemaking process to do analysis. And so also it'd be valuable to have her as a backup just in case um, likely you know, she or Chris will not need to actually do those things. But you never know what happens. Um, people can go on vacation. So that's you know, nice to have that just in case. So that's our recommendation is again, uh, Tom as the primary and Chris and Sarah as the backups. Madam Chair. Yes. So why do we have to do it? Because yeah. your because it's your rules. So it's in our rule. Well, no. Because this you, doesn't you, say that that we the council have to do it. Well, I think you're the because the rules are the council's rules, you're the one who has the authority to, you know make and change the rules, you're the one who has the authority then to uh, appoint. appoint. You're the state agency that adopts the rules. So it says each state agency that adopts the rules, that's in this instance, it's FSAC. I didn't know you were an agency. You're considered an agency. No, thank you. Yeah, he, <laughs> I hear, finally. So the distinction yeah, is you know, hmm. council has its own set of rules. Right. Um, and so this is where we're a little bit different than a lot of other agencies. Um, where you may have a border commission that, like uh, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, they have one set of rules. Their rulemaking authority, or you know, is the Land Conservation and Development Com Commission. For the Department of Energy and FSEC, there are two sets of rules. So you have 100% authority on FSEC's rules, and then Director Benner has 100% authority on the agency's rules. She does not have authority on your rules. You do not have authority on her rules. That's why the agency has other rulemaking coordinators that get appointed for the Department of Energy. By the director. By the director. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Good question. Because, you know, we never appointed the rules coordinator for LCDC, you know, at, at the council level. Just was appointed by the director. Right. Any other questions, comments? This is Ken, Madam Chair. I move that the council appoint Thomas Jackson or Jackman, sorry, <laughs> as rules coordinator, Christopher Clark, senior citing analyst, and uh, Sarah Esterson, senior policy advisor, as backup rules coordinators. 
Second. Questions, comments? Well, I was going to second that. <laughs> <laughs> <Can't imagine. laughs> All right. Well, hearing no further questions, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Haley Jenkins? Yes. Perry Chaktu? Yes. Ken Howe? Yes. Ann Byer? Yes. Marcy Grail? Yes. Cindy Condon? Yes. Motion carries, Madam Chair. Thank you. Welcome, Tom. You are officially <laughs> it. And <laughs> you're ours. <laughs> and just to be clear, you are right, Tom. You don't do the Thomas thing. Either one's fine. What do you prefer? I usually go by Tom, but it doesn't it doesn't really bother me either way. We're asking because I got the whole Marcy and Marcy thing going on. Yeah. And it does Tom is fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome and take your vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next item is agenda item E. It's the public comment period. This is an information item. This time is reserved for the public to address the council regarding any item within council jurisdiction that is not otherwise closed for comment. Items closed for comment include the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project, the Boardman to Hemingway Transmission Line Project, and the Protected Area Scenic Resources and Recreation Resources Standards Rulemaking. So with that, I'm going to look at Nancy and Wally and get some assistance to see if there's people on the phone. Because since there's no one here but us, I'm going to say there's no public. Yes, but well, she's working with us now. So we'll have to do a little intro at some point. At this point, I do not see any participants, but let me give them instructions. Uh, so if you are viewing this on the WebEx, um, bottom right of the main window, there's a an icon for participants. You're going to click on your participant name and your little hand will go up. When you're done speaking, you can lower your hand by clicking it again. If you are on the phone, you're going to press star three on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and press star three again to lower your hand. I do not see, I do not have any hands raised. Okay, well, we'll just wait a hot minute and be polite. We are running a little early, but not much. Okay. So 15 minutes early. So we're an agent center. <laughs> state agent No, <laughs> for the purpose of the statute. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting how you know the different boards and commissions, you know, and agencies. There's a lot of variations. Yeah. And what you're called. Yeah. <laughs> Council commission. Mm -hmm. So when you say just by statute, so I go there, right? As opposed to what? <laughs> You're an agency just by the statute that you just you, said. Todd, I and think you mean for the purpose of that statute, which yeah. is an, yes. an agency that adopts rules. You adopt the rules that govern citing issues for the state yeah. of Oregon, yeah. not ODO. Yeah. Staff right. can't adopt rules. You're adopted. So the purpose of that statute, you're considered the agency that adopts okay. the rules. But we might not be the agency yeah. that adopts the budget or something yeah, like right, that. Right, because right. Okay. that's a whole different statute with different directives. So, so interesting. So we only get to be an agency. <laughs> <laughs> rules. Yes, mm -hmm. rules. Rules are us. Rules are important. <laughs> so just a reminder, we are open for public comment for anyone out there in virtual land if you wish to speak. Is it best like agency? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of or something for the agency. <laughs> okay, well, hearing none, I think we are going to move on, and that means we are now going to close the public comment period. The time is now 8.50, and we will move on to agenda item F, which is a case law overview. This is an information item. We have Patrick Rowe, Oregon Department of Justice, Senior Assistant Attorney General, that is a lot, um, to provide an overview of uh, Supreme Court case State versus Gaines. Patrick? Yes. 
Got it. So, I'm going to uh, talk with you today about interpreting Oregon statutes. Uh, why are we going to do that? It's actually the discussion we just have is, is one reason why oftentimes in the work that you do, it requires interpreting a statute. Do you have the authority to adopt a rule? Do you have the authority to require a site certificate holder or an applicant to take a certain action? Oftentimes, when we've seen what you've done challenged in court, it requires an interpretation of a statute. Did FSEC have the authority to take an action that it took? So the purpose of today's presentation is to walk you through using the State v. Gaines case, which is a leading case on interpreting statutes, walk you through what is the analysis that a court will use when it is analyzing a statute and making a decision as to whether or not FSEC, for example, or any uh, uh, state agency in this context had the authority to do something that it did. Uh, next slide, please, Wally. So the case, as I mentioned, is State v. Gaines. This is actually uh, involves a criminal matter, but it is a considered now the leading case in Oregon on interpreting Oregon statutes. So to understand it, we first want to understand what are the facts of the case. So the basic facts of the case was uh, a woman was arrested. She was being held in a county jail. When she was first arrested, she was not cooperative with the officers. They brought her in to be booked. They asked to take her picture. And every time they went to take her picture, she would turn her head from one side to the other so they couldn't get the typical picture that they would. So they put her in the cell. They were holding her in the cell. Three different times they asked her, hey, we're going to bring you over to the booking room now. And she verbally refused three times to go back to the booking room to be photographed. So the corrections officer, rather than forcibly bring her over to the booking room, said, I'm gonna charge you with obstructing governmental administration, governmental or judicial administration. So that was the statute, which we'll now look at uh, on the screen. You could go to the next slide, Wally. So this is the statute that was at issue and that the courts were <laughs> tasked with deciding, did this woman violate the statute? A person commits the offense of obstructing governmental or judicial admi administration if they intentionally obstruct, impair, or hinder the administration of law or other governmental or judicial function by means of intimidation, force, physical or economic interference or obstacle. Don't worry about that so much as this. It's that last phrase means of physical interference or obstacle. That's what the court had to decide. Did because she refused to go to the booking room, verbally refused, did that constitute physical interference or obstacle? Think to yourselves now, decide in your head, do you think verbally saying, I'm not going, is that a physical interference or obstacle? This started in trial court, went to the Court of Appeals, went to the Supreme Court. Uh, all right, so what's the analysis that a court will undertake? This again, now, now we're getting into the analysis that a court is going to apply to any statute it's interpreting. And a goal of the court when it's interpreting a statute is, it's the three branches of government, right? You learn that in your high school civics class. The court, the legislature passes the laws. It's the legislature that says what you guys can do. The court's goal is to try to figure out what did the legislature mean? What was the legislature's intent when it passed that statute? What was the legislature's intent when it said, FSEC, this is what you guys can do? <coughs> That's right in the statute. In the construction of a statute, a court shall pursue the intention of the legislature if possible. Next slide, please, Wally. All right, so what are the steps in the analysis? Seems obvious, right? The court's gonna look at the text. What's the actual text of the statute that we're looking at? Then the court's gonna look at the context. And I'm, I'm gonna go we'll walk through each one of these a little bit more slowly. Court will look, uh, if it feels it's, uh, if court will look at legislative history and very last, if it can't figure it out based on text, context, and legislative history, it will look at what are called statutory maxims. I'll talk briefly about that. 
Next slide, please, Mark. All right, consider the text. Here's a lot of this is also in statute when in the legislature is, is telling the courts. It's your job just to ascertain and declare what is in the statute. You can't insert what's been omitted. You can't omit what's been inserted. So, in other words, you can't ignore language that is there and you can't plug in language that's not there. Look at what's actual when you're interpreting for us something that we've done. It just you have to read the language itself. All right. And it's going to courts going to. First, if the legislature has actually defined a term, so in this instance, physical or interference, uh, the court just has to rely on how the legislature has defined it. You didn't know, you're not going to get to that point in the case of the legislature has defined it. There's not going to typically, typically there wouldn't be a dispute. It's when the legislature doesn't define terms that it becomes difficult and that courts really have to try to figure out what, what did the legislature intend. Uh, and so if there is a term that's in question, the court is going to apply the ordinary meaning of that term. Uh, if the court feels uh, necessary, it will just look at the dictionary. How does is, how is the dictionary typically define whatever term is at issue? The dictionary in Oregon that Oregon courts often look to is Webster's Third New International Dictionary. Next slide, please, Mom. So again, bringing us back to the statute that was at issue in State v. Gaines. Did this woman commit the offense of obstructing government or judicial administration when she refused to go to the booking room? Does that constitute physical interference or obstacle? What did the defendant argue? The defendant argued, no, the statute requires some form of affirmative physical action by me, it's not enough when I just verbally refuse to go to the booking room. That doesn't constitute physical interference or obstacle. That's the defendant's argument. The state said the defendant did more in this case than just verbally refuse to go. She, in fact, did not move her body from one place to another. So under the state's theory, she violated the statute based on her failure to physically go to the booking area. Court of Appeals agreed. And trial court and the Court of Appeals both agreed. And they said, yeah, she violated the statute. She physically did not go to the booking area. So now it goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, you guys are ignoring the fact that it says physical interference or obstacle. So maybe she physically didn't go, but her verbally refusing, that doesn't constitute a physical interference or obstacle. He said interference or obstacle connotes a material or some sort of bodily act, means of you know, standing or blocking or otherwise physically interposing someone or something in the way of an activity or a process, thereby haltering or hampering that process. So the court said mere inaction without more would not seem to qualify under the text of this statute. Okay, so that's based just on the text, the Supreme Court saying defendant has the better of this argument. But the court's also going to look at the context of the statute. So what do we mean by that? Context of a statute are other provisions in the same statute, other statutes that cover the same or related subject. And on occasion, a court will look at prior versions of the same statute. So they're trying to say, all right, we're not exactly sure what the legislature meant by physical interference or obstacle. Are there other statutes that address a related topic that might give us some sense of what the legislature intended when it passed that statute. So let's look at other statutes. One tip that I'll provide in this instance is 
really for me <laughs> or other lawyers that are tasked with interpreting a statute, when you start to look at other statutes, make sure that the other statute was in place when the legislature passed the statute that you're looking at. So you might look at another statute and go, man, our answer is right here. But then you look back and go, well, this statute, that other statute wasn't in place or a different version of it was in place when the legislature adopted our statute. And so that's then wouldn't really be good context. So you always have to make sure what you're looking at was in place when the legislature adopted the statute at issue. Okay. Context for the statute. Can we go to the next one, please, Wally? There were two other statutes that the state in this instance cited to the Supreme Court as being context for the statute at issue. The first statute was interfering with a peace officer. The second statute was resisting arrest. Both statutes included an exception for passive resistance. In other words, both of these statutes carved out passive resistance and they said passive resistance verbally refusing to do something uh, does not constitute interfering with a peace officer, does not constitute resisting arrest. So what the state argued was <laughs> these are, they claim, analogous statutes. The legislature in specifically carved out passive resistance, saying passive resistance doesn't constitute interfering, doesn't constitute inter resisting arrest. But with the statute we're talking about, the uh, obstructing statute, sorry, obstructing governmental or judicial administration, the one that this woman was being uh, charged with, that did not carve out passive resistance. It didn't say passive resistance is an exception. So what the state said is, if the legislature intended for passive resistance, not going to the book hearing, to not be a violation of the obstructing governmental administration, it would have done the same thing it did with these other statutes. It would have specifically exempted passive resistance. Okay? That's the context. Do you think the Supreme Court buys it? No, don't. they don't. <laughs> this is not the clear language. Why don't they buy it? Because it's not the clear language that's in the statute. It's not that they don't. These statutes, I didn't read through them, don't require any sort of physical action. Right? These statutes are broader than the statute we're dealing with. And so the Supreme Court says, these aren't really good context. We're not even looking at, the, you know, it doesn't have the, con the uh, concept of a physical action. Neither of these requires physical action. They're broader. And so if it's not fair to compare our statute to these, here the legislature felt it's these statutes are so broad that they might reasonably be seen as covering passive resistance. So we want to make sure everyone understands passive resistance doesn't constitute a violation of these statutes. So we're going to explicitly exempt it. Supreme Court said they had no reason to do that with the obstructing statute because the obstructing statute requires a physical interference. So the Supreme Court said, we don't accept that argument. It's not really proper context for the statute we're dealing with. All right, uh, next step, please, Wally. Next slide. So the next step, and this is how a state begins for this is really kind of getting into the weeds a little bit more, but before state begins, that would have been the end of the analysis. It's text and context. And before state begins, the leading case was uh, called PGE, P involved PGE. And it would be text, context. If you can figure it out based on that, you're done. If you can't figure it out, if there's still ambiguity, if there's still a question after looking at text and context, then we'll consider legislative history. After state v. gains, now legislative, considering legislative history is automatically built into the analysis. You do, you, even if the court thinks, we got this figured out based on text and context, now it will still consider legislative history. What weight it gives to legislative history is completely up to the court. 
Meaning, of course, go ahead. If you want to provide legislative history, you can do it and we'll hear it. But I'm giving a ton of weight to text and context because we think we got it figured out based on text and context. So we're going to weigh that heavier. That's up, but it's up to the court to decide how much weight to give legislative history. What is legislative history? So we go to the next slide, please, Wally. So there are different ways you can figure out legislative history. I do this fairly frequently when I'm trying to figure things out. And you'll, you'll, I'll ask my paralegal, say, pull the legislative history on this statute. And initially what I'll get is a bunch of documents that show the different versions of a statute. It shows the minutes from committee hearings. It shows Todd or Todd's predecessor coming and testifying before the legislature. Everybody that comes, witnesses that testify before the legislature. Then you can order the audio and you can listen to the committee hearings and you can hear what people were saying. Lots of different things. There's comments of legislators, statements of legislators. That's going to be your best. If there's actually legislators that are saying things that are relevant to your issue, as often as not, you pull the legislative history and it's just not at all helpful because they're not the needle in a haystack, right? But if a legislator has actually weighed in, and said something about your topic, that's the golden ticket. That's what a court's going to give a, a good amount of weight to that because they actually have statements from a legislator or a committee about what they meant. You'll also consider testimony of non legislator witnesses, anybody that's going before the legislator and legislation saying, We think you ought to pass this, we don't think you ought to pass it. Statements of committee counsel, the legislature, of course, has their own attorneys and they provide summaries to the legis legislators. Marcy is very familiar with this. And any history of amendments. All right, in this case, in state begins, the court, and this is, I'm not going to get into this with too deep, but the court did look at legislative history. There was in an earlier version. Uh, in an early version of the obstructing uh, governmental administration, there was a reference to a legal analysis it's called the American Law Reporters that summarized a given area of law. And in this instance, the bill referred to this analysis, this summary of other statutes around the country, other obstructing governmental administration statutes. And the court looked at that summary. And they said this summary is real similar and what it's saying how other states treat this obstructing governmental administration supports our analysis of the text and the context, meaning other states and this summary that was referred to in the bill and or in the law at issue supports that passive resistance does not constitute obstructing governmental justice. So that was the legislative history that the court looked at in state began so all those steps, the court reached the conclusion that the defendant had not violated that statute. Uh, next slide, please, Wally. So again, then, and then actually, I do want to make this point, although I've already said it, the Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals, right? And so I think that's just an excellent way. People often come and say, well, what's the law say on this? You can have the best legal minds in the state of Oregon or the country, one of them, one court, our Court of Appeals, excellent attorneys, looked at the same statute that the Supreme Court looked at, and they came, reached completely opposite conclusions. So it's not, the law isn't always black and white, it's often white gray. Uh, all right, we've talked about text, context, legislative history. If it can't be figured out based on that, and more, most times it, it will be. Uh, but if it can't, the last resort, a court will look at what's called statutory maxims. What are statutory maxims? These are usually judicially created. It's basically a court saying kind of an assumption. Well, we can't figure it out based on text, context, or legislative history. What do we think a legislature would prefer? And there's certain maxims or you know, kind of concepts that the court will apply. And I've provided two, these are the two most common examples. One is unreasonable results. So if you have two different ways to interpret a statute, and one of them is just clearly unreasonable or absurd, then the court will say, 
the legislature must have meant to go with the one that's more recent. Another statutory maxim is avoidance, and that is if there's two or more ways to interpret a statute, one of the interpretations requires the court to decide whether a constitutional issue, right? Is this even constitutional? If the court can avoid weighing in on whether or not an interpretation is constitutional, if one of the interpretations will allow it to not have to make a decision on the constitutionality, then it's going to go with the other one. It's not going to try to address a constitutional issue that doesn't have. Statutory maxims, at least in my experience, the case law, it's not, you don't normally get this far. It's usually decided based on text, context, and legislative history. So I wouldn't clutter your mind too much with statutory maxims, but do know that they exist. And if it can't be figured out based on those first steps, a court may resort to the statutory maxims. Next slide, please, Molly. So again, wrapping it all up, just remember these are the steps, text, context, legislative history, last resort, statutory maxims. Next slide. And that's all I've got, unless. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. My people are going to hate that. Just like you, I'm still smarter for my regular job. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? Oh, sorry, Cindy. Sure, yeah, um, Cindy Clinton. So, I have a question. So, some FSEC cases have gone to the Supreme Court and reversed, and we've been reversed, right? And do some, we yes. do we discuss some. that? You know what? You know, just like you just went through state gains. Uh, do we look at that and, you know, for informing future? We certainly could. Action. No. I mean, we, we definitely look at it internally. I'm, I'm sure. And for example, a couple of years ago, there was a piece of amendment rules that were overturned. We came back to council and said this was overturned. And now this is what will the action that we're going to take to be consistent with the Supreme Court's ruling. Thank you. I was wondering, how do we put it, you know, back together if there's a decision that is, you know, contrary to what we decided, then how does that inform future? I'll give, I'll give another example. So we will, in that case, it's the case that looked at our amendment rules this coming year, Tom will be talking about that, I think maybe next month. In the near future, we'll be revisiting those rules. And when we revisit those rules, we'll keep in mind that Supreme Court decision to make sure that everything we're doing is consistent with that decision. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Yes. A question. So it kind of goes, this was a good sort of segue into my question because, you know, what was really discussed here is what happens when it's sort of challenged? How does that get looked at? by, you know, an appellate body, you know, which is incredibly helpful. But how do we take this information on a daily, weekly, monthly basis when, you know, staff's doing an evaluation and council's making these conclusions because there are a lot of rules and there's a lot of interpretations that get made all of the time. You know, we have a lot of, you know, statutory um, language, some of it's very clear, some of it's not very clear. Um, and, you know, council makes rules based on that. And, you know, we certainly try when we're doing rulemaking to make sure that we're not, you know, inconsistent, but there is a lot of space for interpretation, you know, and so I guess, you know, I don't know, what's the, what's the way to go about, you know, taking this into consideration, you know, when, when council's making decisions and you're getting confronted with, multiple sort of opposing positions, you know, and somebody's raising this is inconsistent with statute, I guess it's just sort of the, you know, how do we think about this in a more, you know, frequent daily basis, you know, in, in typical council's decision making and not solely on when somebody's looking to appeal us or when we're in the midst of an appeal. I don't know, that's a, it's a lot. I don't know if you have sort of any thoughts on that, Patrick, but um, just some sort of thought process or guidance on 
you know, a framework to think about, you know, these things. Well, I'm, making decisions. I'm always going back to the statute. So when we're, we're talking about doing things, I always want, as your counsel, I'm always looking at the statutes and figuring out or thinking about, do we have the authority to do this? Or do I need to look into this more? Do I need to look into the legislative history and understand it? So I don't know that I do it every day, but anytime the little bell goes off and, and the question is, the bell goes off, meaning the authority question, do we have the, the authority? Then I'm always going to go back and look at the statutes. And so I, I think oftentimes we we focus on our own rules and rightfully so you pass the rules you've given a lot of thought and the rules are kind of the first line but always remember that there has to be a statute backing up that rule and so it we should also always be looking at the statutes that are related to the rules and related to the actions that we're taking that's that's about the best i can say is don't don't forget about the statutes sure, go ahead, Anne. Oh. To some extent, the council also has its own legislative history in its rulemaking. So where we make decisions that are controversial or subject to interpretation, making sure that the record reflects our decisions um, so that, that in some cases, our rules are challenged as opposed to the statute and they're challenged on the language of the rules. So making our intent clear um, gives that record uh, to defend our decision making, if that makes sense. No, that, that is a good point. And that, that does come up on occasion where the department is looking at we're looking at one of your own rules and trying to figure out all right what and it might have been adopted 15 years ago and none of us were around and so i know on occasion or 50 or, yeah, or <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is that history and yes. i know chris clark has gone back on occasion yeah. and, and and pulled the old tapes from council meetings or minutes from old council meetings and figured out what was that what did that council intend uh, and so that same type of analysis would apply. And so it really does help if you have thoughts and you say, I recognize that this part of the rule might be subject to interpretation. This is what we mean. This is what we intend. It's good to be clear. Go ahead, Cindy. So and this, I think, is relatable, but um, we discussed a case with limited, um, a contested case in the role of limited parties. Yeah. and. Um, we interpreted it, members of the council interpret, read and interpreted it differently, what limited parties could speak to that memory. The statute was uh, clear, right? There was no definition. Well, I, I, I know I thought it read one way pretty clear. Um, others read it differently. And if that had been appealed or that, um, so, and we we agreed, I think, to remain silent, not, to not make a determination. Yeah, it went back to the ALJ. It went back yeah. to the ALJ. And so, could that have been a basis for appeal to the Supreme Court? And they would have come back to what we read and analyzed. Yes, and it still may be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Again. Thank you. So it seems like I, I, know, I understand the statutes are what the legislature's adopted and we adopt rules to interpret and clarify and in how it's implemented. Let's say we have a case um, under um, contested case situation where it goes to the courts. Well, I guess it only goes to the Supremes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Supremes rule and we're going, oh, God, you know, we're dealing with a changing industry hugely over time. And when we, and that rule wasn't um, contemplating the way things are now. So we want to go and revise the rule now. It would be inconsistent with what the Supremes ruled on the old rule, but if we want to adopt a new rule, apply the statute under today's knowledge and understanding of where the world is, can we do that? Or does it require something from the legislature to go back to the original statute? 
if it's within the authority of the original statute, then you should be defined. Uh, that's kind of conceptually, that's, I would definitely want to see the facts of that specific matter and see yeah. what the Supreme Court had said was wrong with the old rule yeah. and make sure that the new rule isn't repeating that same error. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Neely. Yeah, I think this uh, highlights the fact that we need to be very clear with our reasoning for our decisions that we make. We need to make sure that we marshal our findings and explain the yeah. reasons for why we make our decisions rather than just making a motion. Right. Um, I think that, you know, highlights the legislative history for our rule making and gives more credence for our decisions that we do make. So if we can back that up with our reasoning for why we do it. Those of us that have planning experience, you know, findings, 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 yep. uh, it just helps everybody to understand uh, where something has come from. And we'll make it more likely to withstand judicial challenge. Right. And I'm guilty of that, rushing to a motion, <coughs> and then we vote through it and it's done. I should be saying the motion and say, and for these reasons. for these reasons, here's the findings that I support that motion. Yeah, we've all had the difficulty of trying to convince applicants that you just can't say because. Yes. <laughs> but it, to be fair, to some extent, the staff do provide us those findings. Those findings are in the record, and making sure that we review those and. Explicitly agree with those findings, I think, um, just solidifies those findings. I think staff has done a really good job laying out the findings, and we just need to be clear when we agree, disagree, that yes, based on those findings, here's our decision. That's why the motion language often says, as presented by staff. Yes. Yeah. That, yes. that is your and, affirmation of staff's analysis. Yeah, and, and critical. Just yeah, I think um, going back to Councilman Byers' question about the history as well, we spend a lot of time doing document management so that we can quickly and easily go back and retrieve information. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we've got the records going back from the beginning, not all great at the beginning, um, but I can say at least, you know, for those of us in the room, you know, we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to ensure that we we do retain that information, that it's done in a consistent way so that, you know, for, for whatever reason, whether we get a challenge or whether, you know, as Patrick said, you know, we just need to go back and look at our own sort of yeah. documentation to try to help justify, you know, our conclusions. Um, and we do rely upon that, you know, pretty frequently. So it's very helpful. So we put a lot of time into it, but there's also a great benefit you know, from that time being put into it. So we take that very seriously. Thank you. This is Chair Grell. I think one of the things I've noticed in my six years here is that I think as council, we've gotten a lot stronger in um, asking questions and debating and, and being able to have things on the record. And I think we've been accused more than once of just saying yes to things. And I think yesterday was a great example um, by Hamlin's questions of, of why why you're asking and what. So it's something I'm happy that we've been able to do and think that Patrick has given us a good reason to continue doing so. So anyone else have any other questions or comments? Thank you. This was helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just make one minor comment, and that is I think Todd brings up the point that the record that we have is very important and we need to make sure that you know, I, I have been taking on the role of going through the minutes and making sure that the minutes are as accurate as we can make them because they do constitute that legislative history. And so I encourage someone else to take that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you again, Patrick. That was extremely helpful. Yes. We look forward to future uh, briefings on such things because it would make us all better at our jobs.
Um, our next agenda item is agenda item G. This is the 2023 legislative session preview. It's an information item. We have Christy Split, government relations coordinator to give us an update. Good morning, Christy. Good morning, Chair. Thanks so much for having me today to all of you. And I'm assuming you guys can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you very good. Okay, hybrid meetings always a little uncertain, I guess. <laughs> Great, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So I wanted to come today and just um, give a quick legislative preview of the legislative session, which is a long session this coming year, starts in January. And I think you might be hearing from me and potentially from others um, uh, about session more than usual this time around, and we'll get to why in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to just start today with sort of a quick primer on kind of where we are, um, what we expect, um, and then I'll also just um, talk a little bit about um, what bills we expect and then go through the legislative calendar just so you all kind of know what's coming up. And I'll keep it quick today, happy to answer any questions, and then just know that, like I said, I think you'll hear from me again as, as things start to become a little more clear. Um, so, just to start with on the big picture front, I'm sure that you all know that the state will have a new governor and who that new governor is was decided last week and that will be Tina Kotek. And she's a familiar face to a lot of people because she's been um, in the legislature for so long. She started in the legislature in 2007 and was speaker for the longest time anyone was ever speaker. So she's a very known entity um, and has um, a lot of experience managing um, or just kind of knowing about, I would say, not necessarily managing, but a lot of experience of knowing about state agencies, including ours. Uh, so that's one piece of news that I'm sure you all know. And then also um, one of the biggest themes that I'm picking up on for session is just that there's been a lot of change. And actually today, the Senate Democrats who have the majority in the state Senate are meeting to determine who the next Senate president will be. Uh, just like uh, Tina Kotek had been the longest serving um, speaker of the house ever. Peter Courtney had been the longest serving Senate president ever and is retiring. Um, to just be a grandfather, so he will not be in the legislature anymore. So the Senate has to pick a new person. And I think he was there for, I probably should have thought of this before, but I think 12 or 13 years or something, a really long time. So that'll be a big shift for, um, for, the, for the Senate. And um, so I had to present today, but I think if you keep an eye on the news this weekend, you'll probably see who, uh, who they have selected. And then um, I put new-ish House Speaker just to kind of make the point that it's a lot of new folks. Dan Rayfield became the Speaker when Tina Kotek resigned from the legislature to run for governor earlier this year. He was the Speaker during the 2022 short legislative session, and he was also the Ways and Means Chair before that. So he's got a lot of experience too, but he is sort of still new, pretty new to the role, and it will be sort of an interesting and changed dynamic to have these three new people working together. Then um, as of... Yesterday, when I sent this to Nancy, and when I checked this morning, nothing had changed. It looks like the likely House makeup shifted by a couple of um, seats in the House and one seat in the Senate. And so there'll be 35 Democrats, 24 Republicans. And in the House, that theme of change again, there's 19 um, new members of the House. That's almost one third of the body. There's also a couple of people who've been in before but are coming back. So 21 if you count them. So that's a really that's a really big, um, big, big, significant uh, dynamic of change and newness happening for sure in the House. In the Senate, um, there's actually only one new person, which is kind of remarkable that there's so many in the House and just one in the Senate. Um, and there there'll be 17 Democrats, 12 Republicans and one independent. Um, by the way, of the Republicans, I think there's a couple of other ones that don't like caucus with them. So kind of keep an eye on that. It should be sort of interesting to see if that changes or if that continues. But um, but they kind of have like a few people that like hang out as independents. So kind of an interesting, interesting dynamic there. Um, so I had I had also just wanted to share a couple of just quick notes on big picture policy items, if you will, or dynamics. One is that the Capitol will be under construction and like pretty significant construction. They're doing seismic upgrades of the sort of middle of the building. For those who are familiar, there's sort of an old part that includes the rotunda and most of the basement. And then there's also wings. And then there's also where the committees are is also an addition. 
So those areas are going to be open, the wings and where that addition is, but the middle of the building, which includes the two legislative chambers, will be closed. They're going to keep the House chamber open for session, and both the Senate and the House are going to be meeting there together. So not necessarily at the same time, but like sharing the space. So I think that'll just sort of change the dynamics about like when floor sessions are held um, a lot in historically the Senate and House were often meeting at the same time. So just kind of know that it'll be a little bit different from usual because of that. And also, if any of you come to the Capitol, my understanding is that quarters are going to be very tight. So just be mentally prepared and there might be some. We're still kind of waiting to hear if meetings will be virtual sometimes in order to like discourage the public from coming in person because there's no space for everybody. So anyway, it should be interesting to see how that works. And then there's also um, a, a somewhat unclear budget picture. There was yet another relatively stable revenue forecast just last week, earlier this week. Um, the December forecast happened in November. And so, but I say it's unclear because the state economists are expecting a mild recession. I mean, I think anybody who's paying attention is expecting a mild recession for the country that will affect the state and how that will affect Oregon's budget is kind of to be determined for those who've been paying attention to the legislature and our, our state budget in the past. We, we sort of tend to feel the effects later because of our reliance on income taxes. So our revenue picture might look good right now, but that could change if that mild recession leads to changes in people's income. Um, the state economist presentation made it sound like they're not as concerned about that in Oregon at this point because of the because of the um, continued um, low unemployment rate. So our last recession had a high unemployment rate. This doesn't seem like that'll likely to happen this time. So we'll kind of see how it goes for us, but our dependence on the income tax makes us very, very vulnerable to the sort of ups and downs of the economy. We just feel it late. So we'll just see how that happens. But I expect that you'll see um, a fairly sort of small C conservative attitude toward the state budget um, by leaders because of that dynamic. Um, the major issues, I'm sure you all already read this at this point, but um, the governor's come right in and said housing and homelessness are her number one issues. It's a statewide issue. It's not a Portland issue. It's all over. And so that'll be item number one. Very related to that is public uh, is behavioral health. Um, overall, there's a lot of conversations about workforce, in part because of the tightness of the hiring market. Um, I-5 bridge replacement was really contentious in the past and didn't happen. That's coming back again as an issue. Our public defense system has been in crisis for quite some time in Oregon. And then finally, ballot measure implementation, measure 114, for example, the gun control ballot measure I've already seen um, that uh, legislators are thinking about making some tweaks or changes to that in the session ahead. So I can go to the next slide. And actually, if anyone wants to ask questions on the big picture, that would be fine. And then we could go into energy topics or it can wait till the end, whatever works best for you all. And then, um, yeah, hey, a quick yes, question. As Cindy Condon, um, thank you. And did am I correct that the Democrats lost their supermajority? They did. Yes, yes. Any, uh, any thoughts on, on how that plays? Yeah. I. To be completely candid, I think that was just sort of a fun media story for the media to talk about. I don't think it'll make any big changes in how things actually work. There hasn't been much talk about taking on major tax reform or increasing taxes or anything like that. And the supermajority is only important when it comes to revenue votes. There was a big tax measure in 2021, is that right? No, 2019, that came into effect later, which was the Student Success Act which was a, a new corporate activities tax that's certainly been talked a lot about since it passed. Um, and that I think it was pretty painful. So I don't, I mean, as far as like how it felt for legislators and, and how it's felt since, and I don't think that anyone was planning to run up that hill again. So I don't think in practice, it's gonna mean that much, but it's definitely something I've noticed the news media really being excited to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then anticipate, oh. Sorry, I kind of hear an echo in the room. So was there another question or was that just that little echo? No okay. question. Great, thank you. So as far as energy topics goes, here's why you might be seeing a lot of me or a lot of um, our, our citing staff talking to you about the legislative session ahead. Um, really, there's two top energy issues for this session and one of them is citing reform. 
And we're going to hear next month, you all are going to hear next month, I'll come to um, from one of the folks who's leading that particular effort and we can dig in and kind of see where that's headed for now. What I can tell you is that there's been meetings with a lot of folks with a lot of different opinions on the line to talk about citing reform. Um, those meetings have been happening for maybe 3 months now. And um, there's a placeholder legislation that would actually direct our agency, the Department of Energy, to do a study on siting reform. Um, I think that's just a placeholder, and that legislation is intended to sort of be what comes out of this group that's been meeting and talking. But if nothing comes out of that group, it wouldn't surprise me if some sort of study bill is what moves forward. So um, I don't know much detail about that because it's all kind of to be determined. So but just know next month you're going to get like a whole a whole presentation on it and can ask questions of the people that are kind of leading that effort. Um, we're tracking it closely. Me, citing staff are paying a lot of attention so that we're ready. Um, and I just want to make it really clear that the coalition leader that you'll hear from next month has made it really obvious in both how she's acted and the words that she has said that she really cares about our expertise particularly, I should say, the expertise of our siting team. Um, so I think we're really well positioned to make sure that we're like at that table and that your opinions and the opinions of siting staff um, and the, of the agency are considered and whatever is to come. And I kind of want to pause and see if anybody wants to ask about that, although, again, we don't know specifics um, or if anybody from the siting team wants to say anything about that quickly. Yeah, Christy, uh, for the record, talk from my feeling, I would say on there is uh, uh, Chair Grail for her day job has also been uh, sitting in on those meetings, maybe not every one of those, but uh, I think she's got a good handle on those as well. So that obviously helps us in terms of, you know, her being able to help translate that to council as well. But uh, at that point, I don't really have anything else to say about that. I think we can, you know, unless uh, Chair Grell would like to, I think we'll just, uh, you know, wait and hear from uh, uh, Oriana Magnera uh, next month. And I think she'll be able to give a, a really good presentation on that. Good. Thing, this is Chair Grail that I'd say in addition to that, just in general, <clears throat> I've said it numerous times, energy sexy right now. Everybody wants to play in our space and it doesn't stop. And there are so many people on this meeting that Christy is talking about um, that you kind of cringe and say, wow, it's too much, too many. Um, the other thing that keeps coming up is hydrogen now. Um, we've gone to a whole conference on that. And I think when I listen to different legislators, everyone acts as if we're not doing things right now. So I think it's super important that whatever we're doing, that we make it clear we're we're doing things to be ready. We're not just, you know, this boom's not coming. It's super frustrating and I have to be clear, you know, I'm here for my day job and all that. Uh, but it's it's very fascinating to uh, to listen as we move forward um, of how we're going to be affected and I think that some of the developers might try to jump on board with these legislators who don't think we're acting in, in a prudent way quickly. Um, and I think our processes are going to be more important than ever to to stand to stand up. So just an observation that I've witnessed. Um, I, the last thing I'll say, I went to the uh, Citizens Utility Board Policy Conference, and for the first time that I'm aware, they excluded all of the utility CEOs and they made it a community thing. And so the pressure with more people being engaged, even outside of, quote, professionals in the business, um, I, I think we're going to feel a shift, and I don't know what that looks like, but there definitely are different perspectives that we haven't been engaged with previously. If I may, just Please. to kind of reiterate the point that Chair Grell brought up about the sort of narrative that's out there, this is also one of the reasons why yesterday, you know, I felt it was important to bring up the farm and forest report and also the sort of status of, you know, FSEC solar projects. I mean, we have 3.6 gigawatts of active solar right now, just under FSEC jurisdiction. But those narratives that are out there don't talk anything about what's happening. They just talk about the need for, you know, the future. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, that information gets shared, it gets put out there. Obviously the farm and forest report will be given to the legislature as well. So, you know, we can't sort of change what the narrative is going to be from people, but we can at least put the data out there that maybe is, you know, pushes back on some of that narrative because it's not entirely truthful. Well, thank you, Chair Grail and, and Todd for the observations. Um, yeah, concur on all fronts. Um, so just to quickly talk about what else, again, energy being sexy as the chair put it is true. 
um, energy efficiency is usually not on that list, but this time it will definitely be a big issue. And it's been a pretty like contentious task force that's been meeting, talking about energy efficiency in new and existing buildings. So we'll see what comes out of that conversation, what sort of policy comes out, but that'll also be, I think, sort of the twin big deal on energy. Um, I think these other issues are also really important and likely to likely to come up during, or will come up during session um, incentive programs, including extending our solar rebate program, which is mostly for residential scale solar, um, federal funding and related budget items. Um, I'm sure that you all have heard uh, from Todd or from our staff before, but if you haven't, the agency is getting quite a bit of federal funding directed our way for mostly for energy efficiency, um, but for energy projects in general. So that's coming up. Uh, statewide energy strategy is something we actually recommended the state coming up with in our recent biennial energy report. So um, that's a conversation a couple of legislators are also bringing to the table. Um, two things that you'll definitely want to pay attention to as uh, as a council as well. There is a package of legislation being developed on rural energy development that is being put together by um, a group called Making uh, Energy Work for Rural Oregon. Uh, they have a policy committee and they've been working really hard to come up with a package. So I'm not sure what will be in that package at this point, but I do expect that to come forward. And when I come back and talk more with you, I can tell you what sort of details were in that, if any of them affect siting. And then finally, um, Chair Grail mentioned hydrogen specifically. Hydrogen and then also offshore wind in particular have been just really um, hot issues in the state, and I expect legislation on both of those um, from various places, probably multiple pieces of legislation, and we'll kind of see what gets moving during session. Any questions on any of that before I move on to the last quick slide? Well, this is handling, and I just make the observation that the last three bullets you had there are pretty related to each other, mm -hmm. and um, it would be interesting to see if there's intertwining uh, among those issues before the session. Yes, you're absolutely right. I think that's something we've been thinking is we kind of need to get together and figure out what we want to do as a state. And if we just sort of pursue like one offs, is that going to be the most strategic thing? So I think you're absolutely right. That's a really astute observation and we'll see how they all interact during the session to come. And then I can go to the last slide. And this is just our calendar for the session. Um, so the legislative session you'll see in bold starts January 17th. There's always sort of an on ramp. Um, really, I would say December 7th and 9th legislative committee meetings is when we kind of get the preview of what bills are out there and what I haven't heard about yet. Right? So we'll know then. And then bills get filed. Most of the bills that will come up in session get filed December 21st. I don't know if WebEx is picking up my cap, but I'm so sorry. I wanted to be with you all in Hermiston, but my husband's out of town, so I was stuck home. And now, of course, I have a cat. Um, and then um, the swearing in day where the legislators all come together and there'll be like a big speech from the new governor, a big speech from the new presiding officers. They have to get voted in by the whole chamber on that day. That'll all happen on January 9th. And then January 17th, session starts in earnest. There's a bunch of deadlines that keep the work flowing during the legislative session. You can expect that the busiest time will be right around that April 4th first chamber work session deadline. That's always a real intense time. And then the last day of session will be somewhere between likely June 15th and June 25th, which is the last day um, uh, under the constitutional amendment um, or constitution, not necessarily amendment um, <laughs> that, uh, that the legislature can meet without having a super majority vote to continue, which will likely never happen. Yeah, and just to sort of add into that, you know, we, we talked about this in the past, um, but for those who maybe weren't here during the long uh, last, uh, the last long session, so you know, we certainly, you know, evaluate and, and participate in the, you know, direct siting relating bills that, you know, that will impact FSEC, but we also track every land use bill because, you know, the way the land use system works, you know, in Oregon is, our land use standard basically ties back to either the direct applicability of LCDC statutes or rules or uh, local government uh, adopted comprehensive plan and land use ordinances. So it's critical that we evaluate those and there are always a flurry of land use bills in every session or every long session. So many of them, you know, don't end up being uh, completed. Um, many of them are unrelated, but most of them have relating to clauses that are so broad 
that could be converted into anything near the end of the session, which then requires uh, a lot of diligence on our part to make sure that we're just keeping an eye on them to understand how they may, you know, be uh, you know, indirectly uh, affect the council and and you know council's rules and program. So it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's the short version. Sure, Grail. Yes, Anne. Just a question. Um, has the agency submitted any bills preseason? Yeah, just a um, summary of those. Go ahead, yes, yes. Uh, yes, thanks for asking. That's a really good question. And I'm sorry for not thinking to include it here. Um, we, I think in part, because we were waiting to make sure we could submit those bills that the new governor would um, approve them or whatever, but actually they're being submitted by governor Kate Brown. And so we, it's actually not, we didn't have to wait. It's kind of interesting to find that out. So, um, we have two pieces of legislation that will be um, dropped or filed by December 21st. One of them is to extend the sunset for that solar rebate program that I mentioned real quickly. That's our bill that would do that and um, also make a technical fix to that solar rebate program. And that's been a really successful program. That's been really great for um, sort of distributed solar, not the kind of solar you all work on, but the kind that's on rooftops of affordable housing or residential. So, um, so that that bill is one we're really excited about. And then we also have legislation that establishes a program at the agency to help communities apply for federal or state funding for energy projects. So, essentially, we want to have a person on our staff, a program at our agency that's responsive to community needs. And it's specifically geared toward environmental justice communities that are now defined in statute and include rural communities, coastal communities, tribal communities, low-income communities, uh, communities that have a, a lot of immigrants or communities that have a lot of people of color. And then there's also some other, other pieces in that definition too, like health equities comes up. So it's a pretty broad definition, but we wanna help essentially local governments is kind of the target audience there or tribal governments help them um, uh, because we've heard a lot about capacity being an issue in smaller communities or tribal communities. So we wanted to be responsive to that, to have a person on our staff who can be more of a helpful hand. So that's the other piece of legislation. We're calling it the navigator. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Other questions? Do you have anything else, Christy? Nope, that's all for me. Thank you. Well, we will look forward to seeing you regularly during the session. Yeah. Thank you for your efforts and joining us this morning. If there's nothing else, we will close that agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Grout. So, we are now on a break, it says, uh, but we don't have any more agenda items because Agenda item H, the Weston Solar Project, we've agreed to keep the record open so the uh, applicant can respond to the comments made yesterday. So December 2nd is their deadline, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Um, so does anyone have any further questions or comments? And yes, Todd? Uh, outside of the agenda item, yeah. so as long as uh, we're concluding that. I think we are concluding that. I'm so you do still have the future dates on the agenda. Oh, oh, uh, I, I, I that must have been a clerical error. Um, I had that in the uh, secretary report, so oh, okay. that was the intention. So that must have been uh, a thought that we didn't uh, clarify. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then, if there are no other formal items, then we will go ahead. Yeah, I just want to if. If this is council member Jenkins last meeting, which is unclear at this point, <laughs> <laughs> we don't know Hanley. <laughs> I just want to this before. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's hard to know. There's sort of been uh, multiple times. Um, I just, if it is, I just want to express my sincere gratitude for the amount of work, you know, that Hanley puts in, um, you know, he reads everything um, in fine detail. He gets in so far into the weeds and it makes us so much better. And I just greatly appreciate all the time and effort, you know, that you put into this. And, you know, I think most of you kind of know his history, but, you know, not only 10 years on FSEC, but eight years on 
the Land Conservation Development Commission. You know, during that entire time, he was you know full time planning director. You know, and then was for you know, a portion of the time that was on FSEC. And you know, not only that, but the amount of uh, travel that he put in. You know, living you know in the Grand area, you know, is considerable. So I can't. I just can't say enough um, in terms of my appreciation and gratitude. And if it is your last meeting, we will have you back. This is not, you know, this is not a good send off. So we will have a proper send off and a proper thank you if it is your last uh, meeting. So I just, again, I cannot say enough to, to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. And to your thank point, you. I will start reading. I tell Todd all the time I read them, but I'm not getting crazy because I know you're reading too. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be looking at those minutes differently. And no pressure, Kent, but uh, <laughs> without our land use planner here, and even though Todd exists, no pressure, Kent. And, 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 and. Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I've just good. been pinging at Kent because I yes. can see him. That's most of yeah. the <laughs> That's have to good. reconfigure our uh, seating arrangements so I can look at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I uh, for myself, that's not a background that I have, so I am heavily dependent on those of you who do that work. And just like I look at Cindy, I know she's tracking all the financial things pretty heavy, so uh -huh. I I know there's we've got a good balance on our team, and I've learned a lot from Hanley because I've hung out with him for six years, uh, so that's been really awesome too. So, all right, any other comments, questions? Well, then, the official gavel here, then the time is now 951 and the November 17th, 18th, 2022 meeting of the Energy Facility Siting Council is now adjourned.